So in this video, we are going to be talking about um, marine estuaries. And in this video, we are going to be going over these key concepts, which I am just going to scroll through pretty quickly here. And then you can go back and revisit these if you want to. So there's different um, characteristics of estuaries, but basically they are an inlet of the ocean that extends into some kind of river situation. So um, it's where salt and fresh water tend to mix. Um, the first term that I want you to know here is embayments, which means that there is a bayer cove that is denting into the land. And a lot of times there's estuaries that are partially isolated from the sea by land and they are spaces that are diluted by fresh water. So we are going to talk about a couple of these in picture. So the first one I wanted to show you was the coastal plain estuary. This is a space where melting glaciers have made the sea level rise. The next one that I'm gonna show you, and, and examples of that would be like the Gulf of Mexico or the Eastern Atlantic coasts. Um, the next one I'm gonna show you is a drowned river valley where the seafloor either sunk or the land around the river raised up from different tectonic forces. Um, and then important to note is the size and shape and water flow of of an estuary really varies in for lots of reasons that we will talk about in this. So a coastal plain or a drowned river valley, I really wish this was done as an animation, but I could not find an animation of this. I would love to know if one exists out there that I missed, but uh, basically you can picture that this is a river coming down into the ocean, but you can see that the ocean has kind of surged in a little bit high here. That's why it's called a drowned river. Basically, uh, this is where over time, as sea levels have come up and fallen, but this is when it's a little bit higher than it has been in the past, this river was maybe the dominating force before when the ocean was a little bit lower, but now the ocean has come up and drowned out that river and come into the river space a little bit. So that's called a drowned river valley. So how can you get that? You could get that from like you have tectonic estuaries where you can see this striped piece of land used to match being, oh, I went off that slide. So this striped piece of, of land used to be up a little bit higher, but then maybe because of a tectonic force, it sunk down and then has made it so that the sea can come into the river space and the river isn't just flowing off of the mountain and into the sea. The sea is able to surge in. That would be a tectonic force. Another one would come from fjords when they have had a glacier that has carved out over time this big deep space that has allowed the sea to come into the space. And then there can be bar-built estuaries where there is a type of um, land like maybe a barrier island that is blocking and the ocean and making these lagoons that come in with the river flowing out. So this would be more of the salt water, this would be more of the fresh water there. So there's actually different salt mixing patterns and salt doesn't, it's like um, different temperature water. It doesn't just automatically perfectly mix and feel the same everywhere. Salt can actually mix horizontally and I have a picture of that here where you actually have water from glacier melt in Alaska. So this is gonna be on this side. This is very fresh very cold water because it's off of glaciers and fresh water because it was previously just ice. And you can see that it's running into ocean water that's gonna be warmer and it's gonna be way saltier. And you can actually see a line where these things of two different temperatures and two different salt levels don't just automatically mix. They kind of hit, hit each other and they have different densities. So it takes a long time to them to have them acclimate and mix. So that would be horizontal salt 
um, mixture, okay, where you can visu visually see it. Um, you can actually see this as a scuba diver, and you can see this sometimes where the salt up high, this is when it doesn't mix as well vertically, um, the salt up higher will be, um, it'll be less dense with salt, and then as you go deeper, you'll see a very thick, like, halo cline where the salt becomes way, um, as the temperature of the water changes and there's a thermal cline, the colder water can hold a lot more salt. And this is the line and it's very spooky looking and you can actually see it where the colder, salter, saltier water is down below. So there's also something called tidal over mixing. This is where um, tidal water, so ocean water is over mixing, meaning it's, it's coming over, the salt water is coming over the um, fresh water and that's why it's called tidal over mixing because the salt water is coming in from above and mixing with the fresh water below. Okay, so different types of estuaries, you can have them be called a positive estuary or a negative estuary. And a positive estuary is where there's a lot of um, river water flow out to the ocean. So there's a lot of fresh water flowing out to the ocean. And there's so much of it that you don't have to worry about evaporation of the fresh water here. The surface water is a lot less dense and it flows out to the ocean. And then the denser salt water is down below. So that's called a positive estuary, more flow in from the river. And then you can have other areas where you have these hot, area, arid desert regions where you don't have much river water because it's a hot, arid desert. So in these areas, you have a lot of evaporation, so very little fresh water. So in this um, example that you see here, there is runoff from a, a river or stream here in this picture, but this is actually... Um, a side drying of the Middle East. And so if you can picture it in the Middle East, you're not going to have a lot of river fresh water running out into the ocean. So you're going to have a lot of evaporation. Um, that's going to make some areas where the ocean water that's coming in this way, so it's coming in here from the left, it gets caught in these spaces and becomes very stagnant water that is not um, very productive with fish or plants. So there's not a whole lot of growth here because there's not a lot of oxygen. There's not a lot of detritus, like dead and decaying matter. And so it's, it's going to be very stagnant. Well, this is like representative of the Black Sea in this area. And here is um, a representation of the Mediterranean Sea. So this kind of feeds, the Black Sea kind of feeds into the Mediterranean Sea. You'll still have a lot of evaporation, but a little more mixing, but it's still not as high productivity because there's still not a lot of replacement and turnover. And then here you have the Strait of Gibraltar, which is between... Um, Spain and Morocco, like a very thin area that leads out to the ocean. And so I want to show you what that looks like here. So here in this picture, you have the Atlantic Ocean. You do have Spain here and you have Morocco here and this tiny little strait from the ocean that comes and feeds this massive Mediterranean Sea. So you can see that there's not a lot of um, backward sloshing of this water that is feeding those two. So this Mediterranean Sea is going to be a lot more stagnant, calm. Um, and so there's not massive waves here like ocean waves and things like that. But it's also not getting a lot of new nutrients, not a lot of new fish or other organisms. They're very locked in here with this Mediterranean Sea. And then way back in here is the Black Sea that is fed by maybe a few little small um, rivers and streams, but it's not going to be much. And then this Mediterranean Sea is mostly what's feeding the Black Sea. And so you can see that this would be in an arid, hot area. This is going to be low oxygen, low productivity. And this is why it's very, very landlocked. Okay. So a different type of estuary is called a salt wedge estuary. A salt wedge estuary is shaped like a wedge. 
okay? And in these pictures, this green water and the arrows show that this is fresh water going out with the arrows. So this one has a lot of fresh water, but you'll also see the blue is seawater and it is really coming up. So you have strong seawater flow and you have strong river flow and they kind of clash here in the middle and will mix a little bit and you'll see some water mixing. And this, a good representation of this would be like Mississippi, Amazon, or the Congo. And you will see, you know, here's just a larger picture of the salt wedge and the mixing of the river and the seawater. So also you can have something called a well-mixed uh, estuary. This is where the seawater will kind of flow uniformly and watch how it goes from the back here of being very green to a little less green, getting more blue until we're darker blue. The only, this is where you have a strong river flow headed out and then it gets increasingly salty the closer it gets to the ocean, which makes a lot of sense. A good example of that is the Delaware Bay where you see that. The only real mixing here is kind of the little, like little bit of wave action that's going in and out here, but generally it's going to be slowly moving towards the ocean. That is called a well-mixed estuary and there is a larger picture of it. Um, this, the partially mixed estuary, you have a strong river flow, but you also have a strong seawater flow that will actually flow all the way back up to the mouth of the river. So whereas like on the wedge, we had some mixing here, this is going to flow all the way back up into the river. So it's, it's a little bit different. This is like the San Francisco estuary. Um, but what happens is the undercurrent of the seawater is very strong up and you'll have a high um, surface current of river water heading down. And then it's gonna be a strong mixing right here where the two meet. That is gonna be a partially mixed estuary. Um, there's a few other mixing patterns. One of those would be in a fjord. So this is a fjord in Alaska. And remember, this is an area that's been carved by glaciers. And these can change um, seasonally with different rainfall, but um, interesting in a fjord, because this is such cold glacier melt river water coming off of here, the river water really tends to, and it's fresh water, stay on top of the denser salt water down below. And so you will actually have a river of fresh water for a long way sitting on top of an ocean of salt water down below. So weird thing, if you go and dive through this, you're gonna initially be in, in fresh water for a long time until you dive a little deeper and then you're in salt, salty seawater. So um, just this really cold glacier melt really wants to just sit on top and not melt and be fresh water and it wants to be separate from the seawater. Um, until it gets further enough out that it will eventually give in and mix. So that's maybe what you would expect to see in a fjord. So temperature is really affected by how shallow the water is. So if the water is really deep, it can hold its temperature for a long time. But if it's not very deep and it's and it's so it's very just a very little amount of water and it's cold that water is going to be cold and if it's very shallow water and it's hot outside then that water is going to be warmer in these areas you will also have turnover where seasonally cold and warm water switch and and rotate top to bottom and this brings up as water comes up from the bottom of the wetland and estuary, it will actually bring up a ton of nutrients to the top. And this turnover creates a big mixing of nutrients. Instead of having it all washed out to sea, those can be used by the organisms that live there. And these nutrients are the best of both worlds. Um, so if this is an estuary and this is, here's the ocean. And so this side of the estuary has a lot more, um, say, ocean water. And this one is, this side is fed more by the river water. 
the river water is actually coming down from whatever mountains or valleys or wherever it was that it is going to bring a lot of detritus which is dead and decaying matter which is full of nutrients and it's got nitrogen phosphorus silica the ocean water is going to also be bringing in phosphorus and detritus dead and decaying matter and so basically you have the most nutrient rich um best of the best from both the fresh water and the ocean water meeting in one place which makes for a highly productive food web so the detritus, again, the dead and decaying matter provides the basis of the food web. And I tried to show the de like dead and decaying matter here <clears throat> and how many organisms come here to eat. And obviously that plays up the food web where other organisms, you know, benefit from that dead and decaying matter of, as larger and larger things eat smaller things. So the silt and clay will also release a lot of nutrients and there are certain filter feeders like this bivalve that I'm showing here that they will go down into the sand and they'll filter out tons of phytoplankton and tons of different um, bacteria and nutrients that are in the sand, but they'll actually take in more then they can actually digest. But they end up killing whatever little phytoplankton they took in and they excrete it in these little um, feces called pseudofeces, these little like packets of, of non-digested poo. So there's a lot of like nutrients still in there and other organisms will then come along and eat their kind of half digested food. And it's called pseudofeces and it's just kind of interesting. A lot of the organisms there are actually generalists and they'll, they'll eat kind of lots of things so that they're, they don't become too niche. So what's interesting is, is the, this can be a very highly successful, um, productive area of our land. What's hurting it the most is it, like in most places, pollution, overfishing, disease, and things like that, that are, are the most detrimental to these spaces. So, um, organisms have to be able to tolerate a lot of like cold water, warm water, uh, fresh water, salt water in changing conditions like we've seen in other places. And so organisms that can kind of conform or can just kind of match the air environment are called osmoconformers. So think of like tunicates, like in this picture, or anemones. They don't have a way to get rid of extra salt or take in extra salt if they need it. They just have to match their environment. And so they're called osmoconformers. And if it gets too salty or it's not salty enough and gets outside of the range of what they can have, handle, they might have some tissue death or they might die. But most of the time, if the conditions are within their acceptable range, which is large, then they're going to be okay. And those are called osmoconformers. So osmoregulators are organisms more like fish or crabs that they don't have a massive range of saltiness that they can tolerate. So they have different um, methods like glands or different ways in their bodies to excrete salt or bring in more salt and ions as needed to keep themselves in like a homeostasis in a balance. So there's organisms that um, live in these areas are often sessile, meaning they live in one place and they try not to move during the day. There's other organisms like little fish and things that will like swim up and back and down with the waves all day long, kind of getting sloshed around and they have to be very strong and efficient swimmers and get used to swimming a lot in order to stay there. But the sessile organisms that kind of stay anchored in one place, a lot of them will try to be benthic or staying under the water all the time. So estuaries are obviously amazing nurseries. Like one of our top nurseries for fish is going to be our estuaries. Why? Because there's all these nutrients that we've already talked about. There's very few predators because it's very shallow. So big stuff kind of needs to go head out to the ocean. They don't really fit there. And um, so a lot of organisms will have their babies in these estuaries and the babies will live among the safety little of the little hidey holes in places using lots of nutrients until they're too big. And then they head back out to the ocean. And one of 
the organisms that lives there. It, a lot of times is oysters and oyster reefs. Um, they're urohaline, meaning they can tolerate a large range of salt levels. But when they're um, first like born, they're different. They are an embryo, and that embryo turns into a larger larva, and then they're a villager larva where they start to develop their um their foot so that and like a shell so they can cement themselves down and stay permanently on the um, surface until they are old enough to produce sperm and eggs themselves. So estuary communities have oh one of the communities is called a mud flat and mud flats are very productive in what they create. A lot of times you just see them and it looks like a big flat piece of mud, but they're full of detritus, that dead and decaying matter. And they create this entire food web with like bacteria eating the dead and decaying matter. And they have nematodes or polychaetes, which are worms that will eat the bacteria and eat copepods, which is a type of plankton. So it becomes this whole separate um, food web in the mud flats. And I wanna show you um, a picture of what the mud flats look like. I will get to this one, get back to this one in a moment. But this is one uh, mud flat that I got to visit this summer called Belandra Beach in La Paz, Mexico. And this mud flat, goes on for probably a mile or more. And I could be wrong on that, but I mean, it goes all the way back and back into these hills and way far out depending on the tide. And it's just so wide and vast and there's so many organisms that live there. So I wanna show you about mud flats. Um, here is a cutaway of the mud flats and you would see a lot of these lugworms. I have a video here by the Natural History Museum called Lugworm Poo and the Secrets They Hold. And when you were walking around on Belandra Beach, there were all of these um, organisms where you could see these lugworms squeezing out mud that would come out and form these perfect little, um, like it looked like a poop emoji. And it just was these perfectly formed uh, mounds that they would make. And what they're doing is, is they're bringing in sediment and water from one side and filtering it all the way through their digestive system and excreting it on the other side. And so here's a quick little one to two minute video that shows you what that looks like, but they're basically filtering out organic material and inorganic sediment. So living and non-living um, materials out for food. A lot of times these places have a lot of um, sulfur in the soil and will the organisms will produce a lot of sulfur in their gases. So it'll have that kind of like rotten egg smell a little bit, although not much at Belantra. And these are usually found at the bays and river mouths. Another organism that was here, and I wanna show you in the next picture, is called the innkeeper worm. The innkeeper worm is another huge worm that will also filter feed like that, but it's called innkeeper because it creates almost like a little hotel motel inn um, where its little hidey hole is used by all these other organisms that will use its hidey hole to hide. And here's what they look like, the innkeeper worm. And this is a video from Deep Marine Scenes called Facts, the Fat Innkeeper Worm, and how it, you know, how it filter feeds. A lot of the organisms that are burrowers will have a snorkel and they will just filter feed like that. Really cool, really beautiful in the mud flats. And I highly recommend you go and check those out because it's just so cool. Um, okay. Seagrass meadows are meadows of seagrass that are, it's not that common. Um, because algae, if algae can grow in the place, algae will tend to dominate over seagrass. So um, seagrass meadows, um, they are very productive, but it depends how productive they are. depends on how much nutrients they can pull, pull from the surrounding area, but also how much um, nutrients are available in that area, how much bacteria, nitrogen-fixing bacteria that's there. And then also the um, amount of algae, which is a little bit competitive with the seagrass. But seagrass meadows, a lot of organisms don't just 
eat the seagrass, most of them are actually living among the seagrass and will live around it and use it as a place to hide and a shelter and a, just a safe place, but they're not necessarily eating it. Although some organisms do eat it, but, but there's a lot of them that just need it as a shelter and to build this little um, underwater community. Here's a video from Marine Diaries, the sea grass beds that will explain a little bit more about it and a little um, picture of, again, the food web that is very complex due to seagrass. Seagrass can actually capture carbon at 35 the times the rate of a rainforest. So rainforests are super important, but you look at seagrass um, that people kind of like plow over or they go into um, places where there are seagrasses and kind of tear it up with their feet and they don't treat it, I don't think, with the respect that it maybe deserves. If you think about the fact that it can absorb pollutants from our air at 35 um, times higher the rate of a rainforest um, of the same like basic size. So um, a lot of times uh, the main food source that hangs out around the seagrass is actually more detritus, dead and decaying matter. A lot of organisms use the seagrass to hold on to it. So you can see uh, various like epiphytes, that means like plants um, growing, other plants growing on the seagrass. Um, and also epifauna, different organisms, animals attaching to the seagrass uh, just as, as a place to live, to grab onto. So they do have rhizoids and roots to help protect them and different um, babies will all live around this. Here you can see a seahorse and it's the males that give birth as the sea horses and he is grabbing onto the seagrass with his tail and then giving birth to all of his babies so he's using the seagrass as the anchor as he gives birth which is pretty cool okay wetlands are areas that are wet for all or most of the part of the year and one of them is called a salt marsh so a salt marsh is an area that is found um, on the drier side of the shoreline right next to the water so there's a low marsh and a high marsh marsh a low marsh is an area that most of the day it is it is wet from the ocean water, but it actually gets flushed about twice a day when the high tide comes in and then washes back out to the low tide and about twice a day, it is getting flushed, meaning all the nutrients um, are getting pushed in and out and there's a big exchange of nutrients about twice a day and most of the time it is wet. A little higher than that is called the high marsh and it is a drier part area and it only gets flushed about twice a month with the high high tide of the month um, and and then that goes out to a low tide and then it'll get flushed maybe a couple of times a month whereas the low marsh gets flushed with new nutrients coming in a couple of times a day and so this also has a whole important food web um, you have primary producers like uh, plankton and different mud algae and then that you know we talked about marsh grass and that's you know there's detritus and bacteria then you have primary consumers that will go and eat that like shrimp and zooplankton and you have different bivalves and then above that you'll have secondary consumers that eat all of those so a very important food web so in the low marsh you have, this will be like the high marsh in the picture and this is the low marsh in the area, in the picture. In the low marsh, you have um, a lot of burrowing types of animals. So worms and clams that are going to burrow throughout the day, have different nets or, or snorkels and um, different uh, like feathery extensions that will gather nutrients from the water above and remember these guys stay wet and covered with water for most of the day and so it's the burrowing animals that can burrow in the sand and uh you know kind of monopolize the water all day 
that dominate this space. And then in the high marsh space, you're going to have organisms that like to move more, the, the crabs, the snails, the different um, uh, periwinkles that will be moving and they can move to get away from predators and they can move to chase prey as needed. So it's more mobile um, organisms that will live in the high marsh. So we are going to switch gears now and talk about mangroves, which I just think are beautiful forests that are right next to the ocean water. Belandra Beach, which I showed earlier, also had a massive mangrove forest, and I have a picture or two in here that I will show you of that. But mangrove trees are trees that can live like it's a forest that can live directly in the ocean. It's the craziest thing, and it's so important because as there's different roads that produce like waste and and rain runoff and communities that are nearby and some of that waste goes down into the ocean these mangrove forests will actually filter the runoff before it gets to the ocean to keep it clean it also traps carbon um, dioxide from the atmosphere it provides habitat for um, fish to grow up for fisheries it improves water quality and then as the water surges and comes up it holds the soil in place so the soil doesn't run off as runoff and so it really protects the land so there's different types of mangrove trees one is called the red mangrove tree and they live on stilts way they kind of like build these root stilts that hold them out of the water and these tend to be like a pioneer species in the area and then black mangroves will tend to live higher up where there's less um, water and they will actually these are the ones that i saw at like belandra beach that they will throw up these little from underneath well their roots kind of hold them up a little bit but then they back their roots back circular underneath this the soil and it comes up and it protrudes their roots out of the soil to make these like little sticks coming out from underneath the soil, which also make little places where fish can swim in between these places and hide. Then the white mangroves will live further up the land and they can either have stilt like roots or do these roots that come out of the soil. They can do either one. And then there's a, plant, a tree that hangs out with mangroves but is not a mangrove called buttonwoods. And they provide similar shelters but they go a little bit higher up on the land. So these, um, we already talked about the prop roots of the red mangroves, but I want to point out that the black mangroves have these pneumatophores, which are the roots that stick up out of the soil. And these pneumatophores become, when this is covered with water, you can just imagine how the little fish can swim in, out of, in and out of it, or little um, uh crabs or snails can all hide in this kind of damp soil and um, create these little living spaces here and and these pneumatophores protect them a lot of organisms actually anchor themselves to these pneumatophores additionally as there's different runoff and surge from soil from the ocean they it kind of builds up around these pneumatophores so they actually kind of build land um, and build the shoreline around the area so this is a video from national geographic called measuring mangroves of explorers in the field how people in mexico are doing uh research on the mangroves working to replant them and working to take measurements on them to make sure that they stay healthy to protect the land and the fishery okay so here is another food web and i know i keep showing you this but it's just important to understand how important each of these different organisms are to the area as a whole to the larger ecosystem so the sun provides um sunlight to mangroves and to like phytoplankton that are the primary producers then we have the detritus and bacteria again the primary uh, consumers and the secondary consumers and mangroves have their own little ecosystem that way interesting mangroves themselves um, store 
uh, carbon at three times the rate per acre of tropical rainforest. So extremely important, which is why down in Mexico, and here is a video, I believe this is happening in Indonesia, they are working to replant some of their mangrove forests so that they can have these healthy places again, because they are just so important for providing nurseries and, and filtering out pollutants and building lands and protecting homes and communities. So the last um, estuary community that we're gonna talk about is lagoons. So lagoons are partially isolated from the ocean. So here's a beautiful picture of a lagoon where you have the big open ocean behind and then you have this tiny little inlet of water surrounded by land here. And this is a lagoon and it only is gonna get a limited amount of, of fresh water, but you can see it makes this really protected space here. And one lagoon I get to visit every year is called San Alejo um, Lagoon. And down here in the picture, you can't see it in the picture. There wasn't a full aerial shot that I could find, but this where the people are stand up paddle boarding just leads to the open ocean. And if you follow this back, and keep going, then it leads to this much larger lagoon around it. So it's this very stable ocean water environment that has a lot of the same types of animals and organisms that live in the ocean nearby. It just is a place that's very protected um, and lots, again, can be like a nursery for smaller animals to come and live. And so that is where we get the name of a lagoon. So that completes this video on estuaries and I hope you learned a lot and get to visit one of these soon.